very pleased to be able to announce to you the winner of the Shoemaker, the NASA Survey Shoemaker Distinguished Scientist Medal. This is a medal that is given annually, and it's to a scientist who has significantly contributed to the field of some field in planetary science throughout the course of their scientific career. The inscription on the medal is a quote from Shakespeare, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night. No one can match this year's awardee, Professor Carly Peters of Brown University, for her dedication, enthusiasm, tenacity, inquisitiveness, and imagination, indeed her exuberance for the moon. She's also very excited about other planetary bodies, but I think it is her exuberance for the moon that most of us know her for predominantly. Let's give Carly a round of applause right now. Thank you. But wait. OK, so wait a minute. Sorry. That was premature. I was premature. I'm nowhere near finished. <laughs> Sorry, I threw you all off. It's just that I can't help but want to applaud Carly. OK, so I have some other things I want to say first. OK, Carly started to study the moon in graduate school at MIT with Professor Tom McCord, where she used telescope observations to define and classify different mare basalt units. Petrologists knew that the basalts returned by the Apollo astronauts uh, and studied in their labs differed from one another. Geologists knew that there were many lava flows on the moon. But Carly, from long nights of telescopic observations and spectroscopy, was able to link the return samples to the actual flows on the moon, and not just where the Apollo astronauts had explored, but over the entire near side. Carly's fundamental contributions to lunar and planetary science lie in the area of spectroscopy, mineralogy, and geoscience. She's a pioneer without equal in the field of lunar and planetary remote sensing. Through her work, she has provided the foundation for multispectral imaging and imaging spectrometer data to solve significant problems for her first love, the moon, but also for Mars, Mercury, Venus, asteroids, and other planetary bodies. The hallmark of Carly's work is establishing the, quant uh, the quantitative laboratory foundation for the integration of light and planetary materials. And she has applied this basic physical understanding to the mineralogical interpretation of surface materials and planetary geological processes. Among her many achievements, one that stands out is being the principal investigator on the Moon Mineralogy Mapper Experiment, a NASA-funded imaging spectrometer on the Chandrayaan-1, an Indian mission to the Moon. Carly is an influential teacher and mentor to many students who currently hold positions in NASA industry and academia. Her research is internationally respected across several fields. Her talents and reputation are well known in international scientific circles through collaborations in Europe, Russia, Ukraine, India, and Japan. Carly has provided important leadership in defining future science directions and implementation strategies for planetary research through service as an elected officer and on committees of NASA, the National Academy of Science, the American Astronomical Society, and the American Geophysical Union. She has been a co-chair of the National Academy of Sciences Space Studies Board and co-chair of the NASA Advisory Council, a body that advises the NASA Administrator on programs, plans, and future directions. And if all that is not enough, Carly Peters is simply a wonderful person. She's so wonderful, and I just have admired her for so many years that surely her enthusiasm for the moon has, in Shakespeare's words, help to make all the world in love with night. Please join me in congratulating Professor Carly Peters, the Survey 2015 Shoemaker Distinguished Scientist Medalist.
Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Yvonne. That was overwhelming. <laughs> uh, uh, very generous and kind remarks. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the original and future mu moon. Uh, some of you may recognize the first part. I'm going to do it a little bit differently from a normal scientific talk. But if you look closely, there is a lot of science in this, as well as thinking ahead for the future. Now, let's see if I get this is. OK, well, I am extremely honored to be a shoemaker medalist. Um, Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker are some of all of our heroes. Uh, uh, we've learned a lot from Jean. Uh, you expect a little bolide to be going through the, slot, the background and making a crater. Um, uh, Jean is one of the giants in our field, and I'm extremely honored to be part of uh, what is now the Shoemaker Medal group. Um, I'd like to comment on previous medalists, um, because they actually all have influenced me in one way or the other. Um, Don Wilhelms was, of course, the medalist uh, in 2010. He's one of the founding fathers of lunar geology, um, and in fact has written this book that is essentially the Bible of, of lunar geology. It is in a PDF form now, so anyone who's starting the field, it's one of the key books to, to keep on your computer. You can keep it on your shelf as well, um, which I have both modes, but, but it's, it's a key piece of, of exploring the moon. Two of the other medalists, uh, Jeff Taylor and Bill Hartman, um, uh, have many accomplishments of their own, um, but they also were co-editors of the book The Origin of the Moon, with a third editor being uh, Roger Phillips. Um, but the first half of my talk is going to um, be a piece that I had in their book. Um, and the two of them were very important in, in, in that creation because they were my literary editors and, and, and I think improved the original version enormously. Um, and I owe them a lot. The 2012 medalist, of course, was Ross Taylor, who has been providing us um, a continuous integrated studies of how the moon is uh, a representative planetary body in the overall scheme of understanding the solar system. Um, we owe a lot to his integrated perspective of how to understand fundamental processes across the solar system. And of course, last year's uh, medalist was Paul Spudis, who himself has written a few books. Um, um, which have been very important. Um, but he also um, has a different side of what he does. And you may notice that gleam in his eye. Um, he, he's, he's one of the most articulate spokespersons for lunar science and has an enormous recall of detail that is um, unflappable. Um, uh, he's, uh, here's an image of him when he was in the early Clementine days, and more recently he was a spokesperson for us uh, as, a, as a presentation to Congress. Uh, so we owe him a lot, not only for his science, but for his, his continual articulation of the importance of the moon. Okay, with that backdrop, here we are now in 2015. And uh, what I'm going to talk about has actually two parts. Um, the original moon, which was part of this Origin of the Moon uh, book that started a lot of discussion. And then about halfway through, I'll do an addendum, namely the moon in our future. OK, let's start with the original moon. Four and a half eons ago, a dark, Dusty cloud deformed. Sun became star, Earth became large, and moon, a new world, was born. This Earth-moon pair, once linked so close, would later be forced apart. Images of young intimate ties 
we only perceive in part. Both Earth and Moon were strongly stripped of their mantle ceridophiles. But Moon alone was doomed to thirst from depletion of volatiles. Moon holds secrets of ages past when planets dueled for space. As primordial crust evolved, raw violence reworked Moon's face. After the first half billion years, huge permanent scars appeared. Ancient feldspathic crust survived with a mafic mantle mirror. But then there grew from half-lived depths a new warmth set free inside. Rivers and floods of partial melt resurfaced the low front side. Thus evolved the original moon in those turbulent times. And now we paint from fragments of clues, the reasons and the rhymes. Sister planet, modified clone, captured migrant, big splash, disowned. The truth in some or all of these will tickle, delight, temper, and tease. That was the original moon in 1986. It's now, almost 30 years later, I think we need to finish the job. Okay, so here's the addendum. This Earth-Moon pair may be unique, but we have not learned that yet. Let us explore what's right next door and move out with no regrets. We must recall all that we've learned about this dual planet home. Space travel is hard. And we know we will not do it alone. But now, we have tremendous tools to assist us on our way. Nature provides moon special rules, 700 hour days. The daytime brings power-rich light to probe Earth-Moon history. The nighttime brings deep, dark hours to probe cosmic mystery. Whether Moon's near side or far side, there's more than enough to do. With diverse soil and 3D prints, there's ample resources too. Special spots provide safe havens from deadly radiation. One's a hole, another a swirl with safety implications. The hole protects by being below a thick layered lava shield. The swirl 
deflects ions with charge by a strong magnetic field. Exploration seeds human goals that we know will blossom soon. How can you think anything else but to first live on the moon? Our path to Mars and beyond will start with moon and move on. The future is built one step at a time. And we intend to help. Thank you all. That was so magnificent. What a surprise. That, that I shouldn't have been, but it was. What a delightful surprise. We have plenty of time for questions. And I know that uh, some of you will have questions for Carly. All the many things that she touched on in such a creative way. Uh, but uh, you know the science that goes into that and the research behind it. So feel free. Let's, let's make <laughs> use of this incredible resource we have here. Do I see a hand up? Yes? No? Oh, there is a microphone. I'm supposed to tell you to please, please come to the microphone. OK, here we go. Thank you. Paul Hain, JPL. Um, you mentioned the swirls as a potential uh, safe zone for human missions. Are there parts of the swirl that would be safer than others? That's a very good question and is one of the indications that we have a lot to do. Um, we know the basic properties of swirls, but we do not know the details. Um, it's a prime area that needs further exploration. Um, and to do that, you probably know, you needed to get close to these areas to really understand the magnitude of the, the uh, magnetic fields um, and the distribution. It's clear just from the shape of these swirls that um, the diversity is, is over um, spatially divergent areas. Um, that has not been touched at all by human exploration yet. Uh, I'm Kiaris Murthy. I know that you have two parts of the brain very intact, the poetic brain and the scientist brain. Congratulations. Um, uh, uh, my, once I heard your poetry, we are presenting it, I was thinking of video games, animation, and quite a lot of the arts and music and theater aspects of the moon, yeah. you know, for, especially for not only kids like me, but also the kids who are much younger. Yeah. And any comments on that, anything that you're already working on in those yeah. areas as well? Uh, those are wonderful comments. Thank you. Um, and I personally don't have anything. However, you've pointed out something that I think is fundamental not only to everyone in this room, but to everyone who lives on Earth. We see the moon constantly. It's, it's common to all of us. And we love it. Um, and there's a, a wide diversity of, of how individuals, whether it's scientists or or um, any other kind of person that lives on the planet Earth feels about the moon. It's, it's something that brings us together. Um, and I encourage anyone who has a variety of different talents to integrate the science with the, 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 the diverse aspects about the moon that we all love. Good morning, Clive. Congratulations, Carly. <laughs> uh, Clive Neal, University of Notre Dame. So given what you have learned over your career, uh, we say, you said we should go to the moon to go to Mars. 
where on the moon should we go? Well, I hinted at some of that. It depends on whether your objectives are scientific or survival or to build um, um, a solid foundation. If we um, go to Mars, so excuse the, me? the horizon destination is Mars. Okay. We want to learn about going to Mars. Where do you think we should go on the moon? That's that's a good question, and I it's hard to think in a one second response. Um, All of it would be a good one. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, I completely agree. Uh, in that we we learn different things from each place we've gone, and we know that from the Apollo, the Luna, and the current missions that are on the moon. Every time we do something on the moon, we learn something new, and sometimes they're huge surprises. Um, so it's hard to answer a question like that without thinking through, okay, what are the most important first steps? How do you derive parallel steps that converge on the overall goal? And that's not something that I can answer. That's something that the whole team in the room need to answer. Uh, Jim Head, Brown University. Carly, congratulations. A very well-deserved mm -hmm. award. Uh, can you share with us your perspective on, say, the next 10 years of how you would plan uh, lunar exploration, like the types of missions, the type of experiments, and the ultimate destinations, mm. not necessarily for feeding forward to Mars, but just uh, a very important thing to understand the, the planetary body that it is. So like a broad scale program that might get people excited here about opportunities and things like that. Well, the, the most important and obvious one to me is it's an international activity. Um, and, and there are many things to do. We need to get communication, uh, global communi communication capabilities around the moon um, so that we can tap the various areas and resources across the moon. Um, uh, as an international uh, activity, um, which is not just lunar, but space exploration is international, um, it allows us to bring um, different talents together to do different uh, aspects of what needs to be done to um, um, uh, uh, proceed forward with exploration. Um, what I tried to hint at, in both the first part and the second part, is that there's not one thing that the moon provides. It really provides an enormous breadth of things concerning planetary processes and understanding, as well as a really important step in order to go beyond the Earth um, in human exploration. Um, it has resources, it has um, uh, communication linked to the Earth directly. Um, we can get to and from it um, um, uh, uh, readily. We can be practicing the kinds of things that we need to do when we're on another planetary body. All these things have to be done and the moon is the most logical place to do it. So I don't have, or sort of as a, my answer to Clive, I can't lay out a plan myself that takes uh, a, a considerable effort of, of uh, integrated work by many different talents and different kinds of perspectives. Uh, but, but in my view, there's no question what the next step is, and the moon is the most obvious way to achieve our long-term goals, which, I firmly believe is Mars and beyond. You know, it's not just one target, it's several as we exp expand our horizons over the next century. Thank you. Do you think you could use an extremely high resolution imaging spectrometer in orbit? <laughs> Jim, what a wonderful idea. That might be the first step, yes. <laughs> I was wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, the water on the moon, the discovery, and uh, and what you think about that, because I believe it changes everything. Well, uh, for those of you who've been studying or following the story of water on the moon, it, it is a new kid on the block. We didn't think there was much to think about um, in the first phase of lunar exploration. But now we know there are at least three principal um, types of water on the moon. There's water that was stored in the lunar interior when uh, the moon was formed and can be um, evaluated with the 
advanced instruments that are now available in terrestrial laboratories um, uh, and can, can identify the abundance of water that's in the lunar interior. Um, and that has opened up whole new sets of questions about how planets form, um, how they evolve, how the Earth-Moon system evolves so that we can compare what we know about the Earth and what we know about the Moon, in particular their interiors. Um, second kind of, of water is the uh, water that um, is trapped in the permanently shadowed areas at the poles of the Moon. Um, we know it exists in some form, but we don't really know exactly where. We know there's a lot of additional information that's required in order to um, uh, identify um, the specific regions and abundances. Um, there are a lot of people probably in this room who are actively working on um, clarifying the, the um, character of this um, uh, 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 polar water uh, that the lunar uh, uh, poles um, contain. The third type is directly linked to the Moon Mineralogy Mapper, and it was a complete surprise that the surface of the Moon, which is mostly silicate, oxygen, silica, blah, blah, has a, but oxygen is part of it, um, and we have the solar wind, which is mostly protons, hydrogen, and much to our delight and surprise, the hydrogen and the oxygen get together and the surface of the moon has pervasive OH content across the moon um, with higher abundances in cooler areas, that is, you go to higher latitudes. Um, uh, we know it exists, we have a little sense of of the distribution, but again, as Jim sort of referred to, we don't have the instruments or the data yet to really define this in sufficient detail to um, know, is this a resource that's renewable? Can we mine it? Can we, can we then go back and, and collect it a month later? Uh, these, these are things that are new questions that we didn't know um, um, a decade ago. But, but are new issues that we want to explore in the future. So the water on the moon is, is a huge surprise now that we didn't know, or we didn't even think about um, about a decade ago.